So uh, Tim kind of covered the, the uh, keynote speech, so uh, I, I guess I'm done here. But <laughs> he, he, hit it all, he hit all the important points, but let me see if I can go over them again. Um, when I talk about the history of Wireshark, I mentioned that when I first started you know, working on the code, I'd been using open source for a while, and I you know, just decided to make Wireshark open source as well to sort of give back to the community. And I haven't really expanded on the decisions and events that led up to that, and I thought I would do that this morning. So my very first job as a programmer was when I was still studying computer science. And I, I got a job at a place uh, it was a one-person company that made automobile insurance rating software. So you go into your insurance agent, they would type all your information into this program, and it would spit back a quote you know, for auto insurance. As I said, it was a one-person operation. He was very protective of his source code because this was his livelihood. This is how you know, he made a living. And uh, so that dependency on the code led to some interesting decisions. And uh, the, the first one was that no one should see this code. He was very protective of it. And so the code lived on two floppy disks, not these particular disks, but, um, and every night when he finished up work, he would save his work to disk, you know, primary and backup and take that home. I mean, this was back in the 90s. This wasn't, I suppose, that unusual. Uh, another decision he made was that if somebody did get hold of this code, they shouldn't understand it. And uh, by that, I mean this. Uh, suppose you're, Insurance rate depended on the number of alpacas you own. I mean, you don't have the source, you don't know. But uh, normally when we write software, we you know, need to track that information, so we give it a name, uh, like alpaca underscore count or alpaca count. The, the only really big controversy among software developers is whether the name should have underscores or a mixed case or whatever, and people get into arguments about this all the time. But uh, what you don't get into arguments about is what you see at the bottom. Instead of having names, all the variables were part of a big, huge array. Uh, for instance, in this case, the alpaca count would have been integer number 85. And so no matter where you were in the code, you needed to remember integer number 85, that's the alpacas. You also need to remember what integers 84 through 0 were, what strings 84 through 0 were, however many there were, floating point, whatever. You had to remember all that. It was like, it, it was amazing. Um, I only lasted a day. Apparently, I either looked suspicious or you know, he just didn't want this to be my first exposure to production code, but, you know, he let me go after a day. But that was good, because after that I got a job at the university. And one of my first jobs there was as a VMS operator. I, um, VMS is a technology from long ago and far away, but uh, it was this operating system that ran on these big computers called VAXs, made by Digital Equipment Corporation. They're about the size of, you know, three refrigerators. And thousands of people around campus used them, and you know, as big as it was, you know, these were huge computers, but they were still computers. They it had a CD-ROM drive and network connections and, and hard drives and tape drives and so on. And uh, one day I was sitting at the operator's desk and you know, needed to get something out of the drawer and, and found this box. The box had microfish in it. The microfish had, microfish had the source code to VMS. Apparently. Digital would give you the source code for their operating system, but they did it in a very passive aggressive way. Instead of giving it to you on a CD-ROM, because the VAX had a CD-ROM drive, or you know, saying, here, go download it from this place, they gave it to you on Microfish, which is not computer readable. And so it was you know, kind of a big middle finger saying, here, if you have a steady hand and a magnifying glass, you can see the source code. <laughs> After that, I... Uh, became a Unix administrator at the university, and that was where I was, you know, first worked with open source quite a bit, and I, I learned these three magic commands, configure, make, and make install. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, you know, open source for, well, for a long time now, that's kind of been the standard way of installing software, or, you know, at least some commands similar to that. Configure figures out what's on your system and does a little bit of discovery. Make takes that information and builds the software and make install puts everything where it should go. You know, just easy peasy. And this was kind of a breath of fresh air compared to what I had dealt with previously, you know, with the, you know, VMS and the insurance rating stuff. Um, but, you know, other software I had installed required a purchase order because it was expensive, it was expensive or, you know, you had the amount of mag tape or, you know, they, you had these 
you know, parallel port dongles. I don't know if anybody remembers those, like for some various kinds of software that in various industries, that was very popular. And so, you know, sometimes you had those chain, you know, five or six chained off the back of your computer. Um, but, you know, none of that was involved with open source. You just downloaded it and installed it and you were done. And I, I think that these commands don't get enough credit because these really helped, I, I think, push the adoption of open source software. I mean, the, you know, the free software movement and the open source movement, as much as I agree with their ideals of, of openness and you know, sharing code and, and, and all that, and it's, you know, those are very laudable goals, you're not going to get people to adopt your stuff if it's difficult to install. And the fact that you just had these three magic commands that you typed and you were done, I, I, I think really helped with the adoption of open source. Uh, along with uh, being a Unix administrator, part of that job was uh, to help take care of the campus network. And we had a pretty standard university network at the time. You know, we had uh, IPv4, DECnet, IPX, uh, you know, all the other protocols you see there. A uh, bunch of physical air stuff like uh, token ring and, and ethernet and, and uh, frame relay. And um, instead of PPP, it, it was slightly before PPP, so we had slip, stuff like that. We had one and exactly one sniffer. And so whenever there was a problem on the network, my boss would say, okay, go get the sniffer and figure out what's going on. My first task with that in that regard was uh, to go find the sniffer. Since it was a scarce commodity, somebody was always using it. So I had to go, you know, go to everybody's office and figure out where the sniffer was and then go take it across campus. And I would plug it in and look at it. And um, for all the newbies here, I had no clue what I was doing. But that was my first exposure to, to protocol analysis, and that's kind of you know what got my career started in that regard. Uh, after that, I got a job at an ISP, and my job duties were much the same as at the university. I ran you know the Unix systems and helped out with the network, but instead of one sniffer, a scarce commodity, we had no commodity. We had zero sniffers, and I. You know, had to help troubleshoot the network, and we had TCB dump, and we had Snoop, which were really useful, but you know, they just didn't give the same level of interactivity that I was used to. And so I kept asking my boss for a sniffer, and he always said no. You know, I got a quote at one point for seventy thousand dollars for a, what was basically a special laptop, and uh, we just didn't have that money in the budget. So I thought, fine, how hard could it be? I'll start writing some code. And uh, you know, when I did start writing the code, at, at that point, as you guys can see, I had some very positive experiences with open source and some very bizarre experiences with closed source. And that really what, you know, that, that kind of pointed me in the direction of releasing Ethereum back then as open source. And that's, uh, I, I think that kind of made for the pro project success because, you know, here we are today. Um, since we're talking about that, uh, uh, at this point, I'd like to invite the core developers to come up. All right. Good morning. I'm Saka Block from the Netherlands, uh, core developer since 2007. Um, yeah, I work. Uh, well, I worked on because I didn't do much development lately. I just submitted my first patch in a year, so I'll try to get back in the game. Uh, but I worked on quite a few things in the GUI, like temporary coloring, uh, copy functions like copy as filter. Uh, I can't remember what else, but quite a bit. And um, yeah, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm more of a networking guy, so just like you, I program is not my, programming is not my main uh, main job. But still, the, the code is written in such a way that you can find your, your way around it, copy the things that do something similar that you want to do, and then adjust it and, and, and submit it. And that worked for me, so I hope some of you might get into that game as well. Okay. Morning, my name is Bastien Quentin, I'm from France. I work in the telco industry, mostly in 2G, 3G, 4G protocols, and 5G, and it's kind of an NS game, and I can easily guess what will be my next move afterwards. <laughs> uh, since then, I was integrated in the core team in 2012, I think, and uh, I've been doing housekeeping, bug fixing, or whatever, so as to just ensure that the new contributors uh, do not get upset because uh, we are not looking at that patch. Morning, my name's Graham Bloyce from the uh, UK. Uh, I've been a core developer 16 years and involved in Wireshark since about 1999. 
Uh, in my day job, uh, I work in the SCADA uh, control system industry, writing a SCADA toolkit. And that's where Wireshark came into use for us in, in the late 90s as the SCADA protocols moved from serial links onto IP links. And so now we had a great tool that enabled us to capture the traffic and analyze what was going on. Good morning, I'm Martin Kaiser, I'm from Germany and I've been on the team since 2012. At the time I was working on digital television and I thought it would be interesting to integrate some of our protocols into Wireshark so we could make use of the GUI and of everything else that has already been there. Now I'm working on payment systems and I'm maintaining some protocols related to smart cards. And I've been looking into Lua lately, just out of interest, and I hope I'll learn a bit more about that. Good morning, my name is Roland Knall, I'm from Austria. Been developing code for Wireshark, I think my first patch was submitted eight years ago. I've uh, been a core developer since three. Um, my main interest and topic is to get Wireshark traces from places where you usually wouldn't expect them. You can catch some of those in my talk later on today. Um, like, for instance, my heating system and see what my heating system talks all the day. Um, and also a lot of GUI stuff, so making some improvements to the user interface, getting it look nicer, getting it more uh, user friendly and stuff like that. Because we have a really nice GUI, but it's still, yeah. Uh, at this point, I also wanted to point something out. We have a wonderful Bugzilla bug tracking page. So if you guys want to have something fixed, either come by the developer then or use that, because the saying goes, we fix things that annoy us. So you have to annoy us that we fix things that annoy you, or you do it yourself. Hi, I'm Richard Sharp, and uh, I got started with Wireshark because in about 1999, I was teaching TCP IP classes and we had to use this horrible DOS application to do packet capture and analysis, which meant that in the middle of the class we had to shut down Windows 95 that we were using, boot up DOS and do some packet capture and it was a really simple system. And then one day I came across this um, program called Ethereal sitting out there on the internet and although it didn't have everything I needed, it had it gave me the ability to, to change it, to fix it, to, to provide the things that I needed. And then not long after that, Guy Harris and uh, Gilbert Ramirez fixed or, or provided a build under Windows and Graham made it possible to capture on Windows as well. And so I was as happy as a pig in whatever <laughs> after that because I could get rid of the DOS system and uh, just stick with Windows 95, which I had to live with, unfortunately, although I did most of my development on Linux. And so since that time, I've worked on a bunch of protocols. These days, I tend to work more frequently on um, 802.11 related protocols um, and some of the other things that the Wi-Fi Alliance wants. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Anders Broman. I work for Ericsson as an IMS tester. Uh, I got to be a core developer back in 2003. And I'm also working on uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G protocols and things around that. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jaap. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, my involvement in uh, Wireshark started in 2004, somewhere around there. Um, I was working for a telephony equipment manufacturer and we were uh, getting into the voice over IP systems. Tools were there, but not very good and very expensive. So we thought, okay, let's look at some low cost options. This uh, nice product came along, but couldn't really do the job yet. So uh, we made some uh, additions and we made some corrections and I sent them in and eventually Gerald got fed up with it and said, okay, commit them yourself. And that's how I basically became a core developer. I've uh, been doing that ever since, um, mainly working on uh, writing and, and fixing the sectors um, of the many, many protocols which are um, in Wireshark and uh, try to answer the questions which come up on, uh, on Ask. 
Good morning. I'm uh, Peter. I'm uh, also from the Netherlands. Um, my involvement start in Wireshark started about uh, almost six years ago. Um, naturally, I'm a curious person, so I'm trying to figure out things, how things work. If I don't understand something, I try to learn about it. And that's also how I started using Wireshark. I tried to use Wireshark to decrypt some TLS stuff, but since it didn't exactly work, um, well, and it's open source, I grabbed the source code, had to look at it, uh, found the issue, and figured out, well, I can fix it, send a patch. And Alexi and some others were quite nice, and, well, I was like, oh, that's uh, easy, so I'll continue contributing to the project. And over time, I also started contributing to, for example, the CP reassembly, Luba, and all, all, uh, dissectors all over the place. So, that's, uh, yeah, nice. But to be honest, uh, I, I like to see different perspectives from people, uh, like either using Wireshark or their experiences, well, in general. I always get like to hear nice stories uh, when I'm here at Shockfest uh, from users and well, people in general. Well, yeah, something similar for me, as in um, we are a distributed bunch, as in we're all over the place uh, on the globe, and uh, we talk and communicate online uh, via uh, email or sometimes a conference call here and there, but uh, to get real stuff done, to get real decisions down, we need to get together and, and talk about these things. So uh, that's, that's one. Uh, two, it's always very nice to see uh, you guys as the users because you guys are the inspiration for us to keep on going and, and see how you use it and uh, try to get ideas about how to improve this, uh, this nice, uh, nice program to make it even better for us, for you. Um, and thirdly, yeah, Janice, she makes it. Yeah, I think I just agree with all of those said before, meet uh, the other core developers, uh, meet users, and also go to some interesting sessions while I'm here. Okay, I'm going to say the same, but maybe a little bit more. Uh, it's great to get a face time with uh, these guys uh, at least once a year or so. It's great to be able to talk to and meet people who are using Wireshark and find out the the requirements and new ideas that they may have or whatever is causing them pain. And um, it means I get to go to a com conference once a year and my employer doesn't bitch about it. So yeah, that's great. I have a 10 week old at home and this is the only time I get sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but serious. Uh, this is a family gathering for us developers. So it's basically meeting old friends getting to know how the other people think, tick, and it makes it much easier in a project when you then collaborate. Uh, and also, the input from you guys, it's, it's not, no joke that we fix things that annoy us. So um, you can either do it the easy way and use bug tracker, you can do it the complicated way and use Betty's post-it notes. No, that's Laura's post-it notes. Betty does. Okay. Betty doesn't plug in like she's supposed to. Well. <laughs> but you can you all tell you about the learning curve of doing that? No, but that's actually really what we want to do. We want to have a family gathering, we want to meet some friends, and uh, yeah, you people are nice enough to allow us to do that, and nice enough to use the program, so we are able to have a community which we come back to every now and then, and that's just really nice to hear what you all do with the program, how you use it, and every time we get something new which we didn't expect to be heard before, so. Thank you for that. Yeah, basically I can only say the same in slightly different words. I'm also very happy to meet my fellow core developers and learn from them in the aspects of how we develop the software. So I'm, I'm more of a software background and I'm not too much into networking. So for me it's more an exercise in writing good software and I can learn a lot from those guys. And also, as the other side, it's really interesting meeting you and getting to know what you use Wireshark for, and it might be strange things that we've never heard. It's always interesting to, to meet everyone here. Yeah, much the same. Of course, it's a big ego boost when we speak to you guys and you tell us how much success you've had with Wireshark in your day <laughs> job. That makes us feel really good. 
And on a personal note, uh, the dissector course that I do, uh, 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 attendee in Europe said he actually uses it in his teaching at the university. And one of his students found a bug in my code. So I was very grateful to fix that for the next presentation. Yes, same as the other mostly. I mean, we're having fun being all together, being with you also. And it, okay, I was saying that, yeah, I can hear me now also, so <laughs> it makes the difference, definitely. <laughs> so I was saying that, yeah, honestly, we are having fun being all together, which is a good motivation point to come here. It so also gives you the feeling to participate to something special, to see all those guys all together, some of them coming every year, so to share with us. It means that it really matters for you, and so it really matters for us also. Yeah, for me, it's uh, the first Shark Fest in 2008. It was uh, just a core developer right then, and the first Shark Fest was coming around, and a mailing goes around like, who wants to present at Shark Fest? Look, OK, I'll present. And I've been presenting every year since then. I missed two Shark Fests, and it's just great to share your knowledge with people and see that people get a, like, a spark of, oh, this is how I can do stuff. And uh, so sharing that with you is, uh, is, for me, an important reason to come here and being with the Gordy developers that I don't see much, even though we're in Holland, we, don't see, we only see each other here. So it's good to meet and spend time together and talk about stuff and, and talk about you, or talk about you, with you. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and I go to sessions to to learn myself because I'm an uh, independent network consultant, so I I have to learn as well. So it's a great place to combine all of those things. Thank you. Well, um, a few slides ago I talked about my introduction to open source. Did you guys want to talk about that at all, or you want to scoot back down? Um, I vaguely remember some kind of open source applications. I had an Amiga in the 80s, and I think there was some um, uh, GNU stuff that had been ported to the Amiga. So that was my first experience, downloading it from bulletin boards, compiling it. And then I think probably my first real experience is early versions of Linux in the 90s, yeah. multiple floppy disks loading onto the PCs, and thinking, right, what do I do now? Um, but that was probably my first experiences of open source. Yeah, I, pretty much the same for me. I was working uh, with commercial Unix boxes in the early 90s as a student job and people came around with Linux and a bunch of floppy disks and I tried installing it. And basically what I can say is that since then in all the jobs I've had as developer, administrator, whatever role open source has played an important role in the job. And I've, I've really done all my jobs with open source, and that's great. Yeah, pretty much Linux root is the same for me, but I would just want to give you an example of how great open source actually can work. Uh, because in 2013, I think it was 2013, uh, I'm, I'm looking to confirm with Mike, uh, Two guys here gave a talk about something called an XCAP, which was a way to get external programs to capture uh, for Wireshark and not use a network card. Uh, about a year later, I needed something like that for my company, um, but the code wasn't done yet because those guys had busy lives themselves and, and changed a little bit of uh, employers, and so they couldn't finish it. And I just picked up from there, asked their permission to use the code, and got it running and working in Bioshock. And this is actually the open source experience. You have a problem, you fix a problem, you collaborate with other people, you build on, the, uh, on stuff other people build. Uh, it's, it goes with the old saying, standing on the shoulders of giants. It's, also, it's always building on stuff of that, and not having to worry about which legal team you have to satisfy to be able to distribute that, just doing it the next step. And that is actually one of the biggest advantages and fun stuff to do with open source technology. I think the first open source software that I got involved with was that thing called SendMail, if anybody has ever played with SendMail. It was ugly, um, but it had some bugs and I had to fix those I think that was on, uh, on Vax's running Ultrix or something like that, another a crazy operating system from digital. But then later on um, in the 90s, I got involved with 
samba. And uh, then not long after that, I got involved with Wireshark. And uh, one of the protocols or the dissectors that I wrote was the SMB dissector, because at around about that time as well, Microsoft was trying to standardize SMB because they were worried that um, web NFS was going to take over, was going to eat their lunch or something like that. So they, they kind of put out the spec. And once we had the spec, we had a way of writing a, a dissector for it. And since that time, I've been involved with a few other things like Linux, of course, and um, done some uh, Linux hacking. But mostly, I work on, on other software. Um, and, and on Wireshark and a little bit on Samba these days as well. Mm. No, I, I just want to agree with, with Sproul and working on, on open source <coughs> software like Wireshark. Uh, the good thing is that you get people that look at your code and help you fix bugs and it gets run on more platforms so in the end you have a much better code than what you would have if you were doing the whole thing yourself. Um, so this is going to show my age a little, as in, uh, I started off computing with a, what you guys know as a, a Timex Sinclair 1000. Getting the magazines out, yeah, there you go. Perfect. <coughs> Getting the magazines out, typing in the code on the pages and see what it does and, yeah. So, getting on from there, uh, getting an uh, MSX2. Was way advanced and uh, get some CPM stuff on there as well, so that was interesting. Later on in university, got involved with some uh, Linux work and uh, got some uh, patches in there. And uh, from there on, uh, the floodgates opened, and uh, I've been doing open source ever since. Oh, um, that's uh, interesting. I didn't really start with like floppy disk or Unix <laughs> machines or stuff like that. Um, I think I started really getting a speed when I started uh, using Ubuntu. Um, I, I was still like learning how things work, so then well, I was like looking at forums. At some point I started answering questions, ask Ubuntu and so on. Later on I realized that, oh, my NVIDIA graphics card in my laptop isn't exactly working, so I joined an open source project on GitHub, which was basically a, best, a, best, a large best program. Um, nice thing about this is at the time I wasn't really well very like I wasn't familiar with C at all and at that point they decided oh let's rewrite this project in C so that was like a great opportunity for me to learn C and I think this also shows the strength of uh, uh, open source so if you're um, uh, if you're like actually working on a project it's much easier to learn something new if you have a concrete use case if you just work with like some theory, it's, well, you will probably forget it. And working with some others is also fun and keeps motivation in, so. Um, actually, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think those are all the questions I, or, well, that was the question I had, but uh, that, I, that was really awesome hearing from you guys. All right. Thanks. Any, any questions from you guys? Yeah. Oh, well, later on then. <laughs> But while they're getting settled in, uh, I, I would like to point out that you know I've, I'm paid full time by Riverbed to work on Wireshark, and so these are effectively my coworkers. And so Sharkfest is you know the the one or two times a year that, that I have an opportunity to, to work with them face to face, and otherwise it's all through email or Slack or you know whatever communication channels we have. Um, let's see if that oh good. So when you look through the SharkFest agenda, um, I'm sure some of you were looking for a session on open source licensing and you were bitterly disappointed that we didn't have any. And so today I'm going to save you and, and go over open source licensing for a couple of slides. So just so you'll be happy. Now Wireshark is released under, it, it, you know, it's open source, which means it's un released under a license that conforms to, you know, the, the, well, there's an organization called the OSI, they, and they have a set of licenses picked out and that say if, you have, if you're using this license, then you are open source. Um, software licenses and, and open source licenses and, and specifically cover 
a lot of stuff. I mean, there are a lot of different licenses out there uh, that can cover things like whether or not you can modify the code or whether you have to give credit to people or how you, know, you can or can't apply license, patents to what you're doing and, and so on. Um, the, the interesting thing to me is that licenses are not a solved problem, meaning that you know, open source has been around since at least the 80s you know, with the, the, the Free Software Foundation and a lot of licenses have been released since then, but it, like I said, it's still not a solved problem. People are, you know, for whatever reason, whatever licenses we have available, people aren't happy with them, so they keep writing their own. Um, an example of that is uh, recently, companies like AWS have been taking code bases and turning them into services. Uh, like, uh, you know, there are a few database products out there that, that they've been doing that with, and, and some companies that produce the software aren't really happy about that, and so they're trying to come up with a brand new set of licenses that address that issue. Um, licenses typically apply to copyright and not trademark, meaning they apply to source code and documentation and not so much to the name and the logo, which you know, trademark law covers. Uh, a couple of examples of this are uh, years ago, the Debian project you know, shipped Firefox, you know, the web browser but they were shipping it in a way that the Mozilla Foundation wasn't really happy with, and so instead of shipping Firefox, one day they started shipping Iceweasel. Um, I don't know if you guys remember that, but different name, different logo, same code. And you know, that kind of illustrates the difference between copyright and trademark. You, know, you had a copyright on the code they could keep using, but they couldn't use the trademark. Uh, another example of that, which is much closer to home for this project, is uh, the fact that you know, I started the project under the name Ethereal when I lived in Missouri, that's where I grew up. And when I changed jobs and came out here, I had to leave the trademark behind for Ethereal, and so we changed the name to Wireshark. Uh, but source code was the same, it's just that we had to change the name. We uh, used the GPL, uh, um, which I'll talk about here in a bit, but uh, the GPL focuses on user rights. Um, you know, different licenses focus on different things, like I said, and the GBL says that you can take this code, you can look at it, you can poke it, you can prod it, you can measure it, you can, you know, do whatever, literally, the license says you can do anything you want with the software. Uh, the only time restrictions come in is when you go to distribute what you have. If you've made any changes, you have to take the rights that you got and pay them forward. So, you know, when you distribute the source, it has to be under a license that gives people the same rights that you got. And that was something that, very, that appealed to me greatly, and so that's kind of why I chose the GPL for Wireshark. So, as I said, you know, Wireshark uses the GPL, specifically use the general public license version two or later. The uh, current version is version three. We just haven't had any compelling need to move up yet, and so we haven't. But um, something else we do in the project is we don't require copyright assignment. And by that, I mean if you go to contribute to some source code bases, particularly ones you know, run by large companies like uh, Google or Microsoft, you know, if I wanted to commit a fix to you know, the Visual Studio Code Editor, I would have to sign what's called a, a CLA, a Contributor License Agreement, you know, some agreement that says, okay, I'm giving Microsoft this code and then they can go do whatever they want with it. Um, we don't do that with Wireshark just because it's, it's a roadblock. Uh, for, I, uh, a couple of days ago, contributed, or at least I tried to contribute just a one character change. I changed the number one to number two in some source code. And you know, I checked, you know, submitted on a GitHub and I got a, a response back saying, you have to sign, sign a CLA. And it's like, okay, fine. I have to run this by Riverbed Legal now and all this other stuff, blah, blah, blah. So, just this one character change is, you know, has this huge roadblock in front of it. We'll get through it, but uh, that's fine. But anyway, if you take these two items together, you know, the, the license and the lack of copyright assignment, um, I think it gives the project a strong social contract. What these two things together mean is that if you contribute code to Wireshark, that code is always going to be available forever to everybody, and you will always own it forever. And um, I. I don't know if it matters to the people who contribute code, but uh, it, it matters to me, and I, I, I um, like having that con social contract in place. So along with the license and the social contract, we have a goal, and this isn't anything really official, but uh, it kind of manifested itself early on in the project. You know, the, the goal of Wireshark is to help 
as many people as possible understand their networks as much as possible. You know, and being open source helps that, and having a lot of contributors helps that, and, and you know, having well, Sharkfest and educators and, and you know, people teaching people how to use Wireshark helps that. The thing is, we have this goal. Um, the Free Software Foundation, who wrote our license, has their goal. Their goal is maximum software freedom for as many people as possible, which means that they would prefer that everybody run open source software. Uh, these goals are mostly in alignment. Uh, the only time they really differ is when I look out at everybody's laptops. So a lot of you are running uh, either Mac OS or Windows, and those are not open platforms. So when, when we ship software on those platforms, you can get a, a, a better user experience if you use certain tools like Visual Studio, which is not open source. And so, um, you know, where, where our goal and the Free Software Foundation's goals differ, if, if it means giving users a better experience, I'm gonna choose giving users a better experience. Um, kind of a counterpoint to that is the, our infrastructure. You know, we have this, all these servers at AWS and DigitalOcean those run open source software. For our backend infrastructure, I lean heavily on open source and prefer it you know, strongly versus closed source. So sustainability is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, in our case, it means uh, making sure that the project stays healthy and, and continues to stay healthy you know, as, as much as we can in the future. And in order to help that, we have something called the Wireshark Foundation. Wireshark Foundation was, uh, it, it's a piece of paper filed with the state of California that says we're incorporated. Uh, we've been incorporated since about 2008. But this gives us enough of a legal entity to do things as a project, meaning I can go get uh, code signing keys and I can you know, rent servers at, at AWS or some other provider or you know, other things like that. But, I can do my job, and I can do my job on behalf of you know the Wireshark project, um, and that's you know worked well so far. But uh, um, the, the the problem that we run into is uh, if you look at the bottom, there's something called a bus factor, and if you look at you know bus factor on Wikipedia, you'll see that they describe it uh, the bus factor as the number of people in your organization that can get hit by a bus before it adversely impacts that organization. So the higher the bus factor, the better. Uh, we, we do have a really high bus factor for many aspects of the project, like source code is, a, you know, we almost have an infinite bus factor because, you know, we have our repository that's mirrored to GitHub and GitLab. Um, also, if you do any Git checkouts, you know, you probably have a copy of all the Wireshark source code on your system. So, you know, that's distributed pretty well. You know, there are other factors of the project that have a bus factor of one, and that's me. Um, and those have more to do with, you know, the official aspects of the project, like, you know, running servers and ordering, you know, code signing certi uh, certificates, like I talked about before. Um, we are working on this, and I will point out that, you know, for me, the bus factor has a very real aspect to it because I ride a bicycle to work every day, and I ride a bicycle next to these big, huge red buses in town. And the big, huge red buses, no lie, are driven by college students. So um, they do a great job, but don't get me wrong. But uh, you know, when I do see bus factor, I, I, you know, it immediately clicks in, oh, Unitrans buses. Yeah, but uh, anyway. So in order to kind of uh, help address the situation, a few of the core developers and I and, and a couple of other interested parties have uh, formed something called the Wireshark Foundation Advisory Committee. And uh, you know, we, we get together periodically and talk about how we might go and set up something more official and more formal for the project. And so you know, we, we want to do this and we're working on it. Uh, we haven't done it yet just because we have so many different options. If you're an open source project, there are so many different ways you can go. Um, you know, you can join what's called an umbrella organization. The big, two big examples of that are the Linux Foundation, which you know I assume you've heard of Linux, uh, and uh, uh, something called the Software Freedom Conservancy. But uh, the SFC is an organization that help, like that basically provides legal and financial and accounting services for open source projects, and and a bunch of famous projects are part of it, like Samba and. Uh, 
I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you look at the list, you know, they have quite a, an extensive one. Um, another option would be to just go out on our own and start up a, a, either a 501c3, which is a charitable organization, or a 501c6, which is more of a business consortium. Um, by the way, I will point out, if you are looking for a 501c3 to donate to, Chris Sanders over there has an excellent one called the Rural Technology Fund, and he would be thrilled to talk to you about it, I'm sure. Um, and by the way, 501c, if you're wondering about that, um, I know a lot of people here aren't from the U.S. The 501c is part of the U.S. tax code, and so, you know, when you go to pay taxes for these organizations, you have to fit into one of those categories. Um, but another option is that we could set up just a regular company, like an independent, you know, company for Wireshark. You know, that's the, the problem there is figuring out where all the income would come from. Um, and, and finally, we could stick with the model we currently have, which is a corporate over, overlord. Uh, we, we have one, it's called Riverbed Technology. They employ Janice and I, and they help you know, put on Shark Fest, and they pay for all of our business expenses. Um, you know, I, if I need to buy something for the project, I'll shoot my boss an email, and he'll say, why are you bothering me with this? Just go buy it. Um, so they, they've been very helpful in that regard, and they provide you know, accounting and other services, and, and you know, they've been very helpful. And at the same time, they've been very hands-off. So, and that's been you know, useful for the project because you know, we, I haven't gotten any direction from Riverbed saying, oh, you should add this feature or this you know, protocol or whatever. Um, but you know, it, they just kind of, they expect me to run the project and that's uh, what I try to do as best I can. Um, as I said, this is taking a long time. You know, the Wireshark Foundation's been around since 2008 uh, in its current form. And uh, the reason you might ask is, you, know, you might ask why we haven't had something more official set up yet. And the reason for that primarily is because I'm lazy. You know, Riverbed makes our current situation really easy. And, you know, I, I am hesitant to change that. But uh, one, of the reason, one of the reasons I'm hesitant to do that is because you know, some of these directions we go are one way. If we go with an umbrella organization or some sort of not-for-profit and we say transfer our, the trademark over to that organization, you know, according to the IRS rules, if you change your mind later, that's a one-way trip, too bad. Uh, you can't, you know, give your trademarks to a, a not-for-profit and then say, oh, I changed my mind, I want to take it and, you know, give it to this, you know, private corporation. So, you know, we just have all these considerations we have to, to, to go through and, and figure out where we want to go. So, okay, we've got about seven minutes left, good. Um, so to kind of summarize, you know, the project is in a good place and we are working on making sure the project continues to be in a good place and either as good or better than what we have now. And uh, if you do have any questions or comments about, you know, the organizational aspect of the project or any other question, we'll be up in the developer den and, We'll be happy to talk to you about that. Um, one last slide before I say thank you. Um, I have a trivia question. So right now, the Wireshark project is, you can access it via wireshark.org, via that domain. And you know, as I said, prior to that, we were named Ethereal, and you could access the project through the domain name ethereal.com. Uh, for people who've been around forever, do you remember what the domain name we used prior to that was? Oh, somebody knows. Um, the very first domain the project used was ethereal.zing.org. Zing.org is my own you know, personal domain. And you know, to set that up, getting that set up initially meant me going on eBay and buying this little you know, Sun workstation in IPX. And uh, um, I don't know if you remember, the very first slide had a couple of floppy disks. Well, I needed you know, pictures of floppy disks for the first slide. And so I went to the garage and grabbed a couple of disks. And as it turns out, these are the disks that I used to install the very first server for the project. Um, I don't, I just didn't bother to throw them away, to be honest. But, uh, um, but yeah, there, I, I had to go digging through the garage, and these just happened to be the first ones that I found. So I didn't know if you guys would find that interesting or not. I did. Um, along with these, there was a serial cable because I to install the the OS. I didn't have a monitor. I had to, you know serial console into the box and, and you know, get it all set up. But, um, 
One final note, uh, you know, as, as Tim O'Neill mentioned um, in the video at the very beginning, this upcoming Saturday I'm going to get the uh, uh, ACM uh, Software System Award, and um, you know, it, it is you know, for, for work on Wireshark, and uh, it, it is overwhelming and, 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 and very humbling as well. And uh, um, you know, Wireshark is worthy of that award, and it, it's, that's because of you guys, because of the users and developers and educators, uh, people who have helped build this project you know, since its inception. And it, it's uh, uh, an honor and a pleasure to, to be able to work, to work on it with you guys. So thank you. I can't thank you enough.